All right. Welcome again to the next uh, field day seminar um, here at the Warsaw University in Astronomical Observatory. Um, and it's Tuesday, it's 4 p.m. Uh, summer, uh, Eastern, Eastern time, uh, Central European time, but summer daylight saving time. Uh, so it's a little bit brighter today. Uh, and today we have a speaker from MIT, um, Janusz Piętkowski, who's, uh, who's actually a biologist, biophysicist, you might I say. Um, Janusz studied uh, at our university, uh, studied biology, but then did his PhD in, in, in the US, in Virginia, uh, and now is a researcher in MIT and is working on uh, astronomy-related topic. Um, he's also one of the uh, founders of the Astrobiological Society, we had the pleasure to listen about uh, a few seminars ago. So, Janusz, uh, you're speaking to astronomers, so be gentle uh, with us, uh, but the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for the, for the kind invitation and the, and the kind introduction. I mean, uh, indeed, I, I would also ask to be gentle because uh, I hope that uh, you are going to find this uh, uh, these uh, topics uh, which we are going to talk about uh, interesting and I really look forward to, to the discussion and uh, all kinds of questions afterwards because what we are going to talk about uh, today is something that might seem to be uh, quite science fiction but of course uh, well I mean apparently this is my my daily job yes I uh, I know that I, I I, 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 I'm, I'm often called I'm, I'm, that I'm technically a biologist. I got an I got an education in biology, but I switched fields uh, more times than I could count. And now, currently, I can call myself proudly to be an astrobiologist. So, what we are actually do on our daily basis uh, at MIT is um, and is in general to look we we look for life on other planets. And today, what we are going to talk about is we are going to look at very old data and uh, we are going to look at various different uh, cloud anomalies in Venus and and try to actually put them in the context of what we know about this planet because what we are going to learn today is that there are many many different measurements and observations that were done over decades uh, of Venus that actually point that to something very very peculiar going on on that planet and those measurements were often ignored or forgotten or just basically discarded as erroneous. And only now we are actually trying to reanalyze this decades long data again and look at this, this information once again and see if we can actually ex 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 get something, something completely new uh, or a very new view of, the, of this planet that is uh, basically an exoplanet next door. So, but before we actually dive into these uh, clouds of Venus, uh, we have to actually remind ourselves what is this very, um, very interesting object of our study. So Venus is often called our sister planet, but this is actually extremely misleading because, because obviously the only thing that is similar to uh, be, between Earth and, uh, and, and Venus is essentially maybe it's overall mass and radius. The, Rest of the planets, of uh, those two planets, Earth and Venus, are actually uh, are actually quite different. Uh, the surface temperature of the of Venus is actually completely uninhabitable. Uh, it's uh, for, it reaches 465 Celsius degrees, so it's a so it's actually a very very hellish place. Um, the atmosphere of the planet is also very different than than our own Earth like Earth atmosphere. It's basically mostly carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Of course, our planet has mostly nitrogen and oxygen. But what is actually a, a very peculiar or this um, a, a specific characteristics of, of Venus is this permanent, the so-called permanent and temperate cloud cover that this planet has. It's, 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 this is what gives this planet this rather bleak uh, view, uh, an interesting view, but as we will learn today, uh, this is this is just a mirage because these actually these clouds are actually what is the most one of the most interesting places in the solar system. So these cloud decks are actually called a temperate cloud decks, and uh, and they are called temperate because they are technically in the range where this uh, where the temperature regime and pressure regimes are actually quite quite uh, benign. So the if so the temperatures are approximately one hundred degrees at the bottom of the cloud decks. While 
the, maybe they reach around zero or minus, minus uh, 10 or 20 at the very top of the cloud. So this is essentially a very, very ben, a rather benign temperature environment. But there is actually one thing about this, one, about, about those clouds that actually also doesn't really make this, uh, this environment a very life welcome. Because from the te per temperature point, point of view, one could actually think, okay, this is pretty, this is pretty um, benign environment. But the, the, the main difference is that the clouds of Venus are actually made of little droplets of concentrated sulfuric acid. So our own clouds here on Earth are made of little droplets of water and are, of course, transient. On Venus, you know, one has this permanent cloud decks with little droplets of sul concentrated sulfuric acid um, as, a, as a main liquid, yes, as a main liquid in, the, in this droplet. So basically a completely different environment and also quite chemically harsh. So, one was so, but the, the one would say that this is basically a, an environment that is not conducive to life. But nevertheless, this idea that there might be actually something living in the clouds of Venus is actually not new, because this is resurfaced periodically in the literature for uh, for decades and approximately since the, maybe 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 19, 1960s even. And why it is so? And one of the one of the reasons is that it is actually quite likely that Venus was not always this hellish place that we have, that we see today. Uh, some of the modeling and some of the observations of the surface of the planet and the rock compositions from which we, which we have from Venera suggest that this planet might actually have had a water past with liquid water, oceans, rivers, and seas on the very surface of the planet that could actually last for as long as Billion, 3 billion years until as recently as 700 million years ago. So one could actually speculate what if actually life originated on the surface of this planet when this planet was actually quite habitable. And then as the conditions on the surface deteriorated and as Venus entered the path of no return, then that, that this life actually hypothetically speaking actually escaped the only place that it could actually potentially survive to the clouds. And of course, we don't know. And there are people, pe people are going to argue about this forever because some, some studies suggest that, this, that the oceans indeed were on Venus. Some studies suggest that Venus never had oceans in, in, the, in its geological history. Hopefully, the new missions, the Veritas and Da Vinci and also Envisions, are going to finally settle this debate once and for all. But nevertheless, there is this, there is this potential for Venus to be actually much more habitable in the past. But nevertheless, we have to be aware of one of the very important points that no environment that we that we have here on Earth is analogous to the environment of the clouds of Venus, because even the most hardy extremophiles that arrive that live in the environment of um, on Earth in the acidic environments on Earth do not even would not be able to survive in the acidic environment of the clouds of Venus. The concentrated sulfuric acid environment of the clouds of Venus is actually many, many times more acidic than even the most acidic places that are inhabited here on Earth. Even, even such places like these Dalol pools in Ethiopia that are actually already alien looking, those are actually nothing like the environment on Venus. And what is actually more important is that, the, is that also Venus is extremely dry. It's so dry and the water activity there is so low that it's actually 50 to 100 times drier than the Atacama Desert, which is one of the most dry, one of the driest places on Earth. So if there is indeed, hypothetically speaking, life on the, in, in, on, in the Venusian clouds or on Venus in general, then it would require some adaptations that life on Earth never actually developed because it also never had to develop because the environments are so different. So this brings us to this actual point that if there is indeed uh, indeed something living in the clouds of Venus, then it has to be life as we don't know it because it essentially forces the environment there is so different that any kind of biochemistry or biology that actually exists there would have to be completely different. So. This doesn't, it doesn't really uh, prevent us from actually studying the, or looking for potential speculative but possible life survival strategies. And I just wanted to, and I just added this here because I think that this you would find this quite, quite fascinating. 
Uh, but each of those slides, this uh, maybe three or four slides that it, uh, on these strategies is actually a lecture in itself. So it's just sort of a teaser of what we are also working on. And, uh, and hopefully uh, at some other time, I will be able to actually tell you a little bit more about it. But one of the possibility, possible strategies for, li for life to survive in the clouds is actually to have a completely different biochemistry. So to have something completely different than we have here on Earth, we know that sulfuric acid is actually an extremely aggressive solvent from the point of view of our own biochemistry. So we cannot have any kind of sugars, DNA, proteins, not, of, none of this sort. It actually cannot survive in concentrated sulfuric acid. So one unfair, uh, at first glance would suggest, would, would, would think that sulfuric acid environment is actually completely non-conducive to any kind of organic, complex organic chemistry. And this is actually uh, not the case. We are actually forging many interesting collaborations with, uh, with various groups and various other researchers. And for example, this is the work of uh, Professor Steven Benner and Dr. Jan Spacek, who actually started to di diving, or did they di di dive a little bit deeper into the chemistry of uh, concentrated sulfuric acid and various organic molecules um, in it. And they discovered something absolutely quite remarkable, that essentially you can form complex organic chemistry in, such, in this aggressive solvent. You just need a completely different organic chemistry than this, what we have here in biochemistry on Earth. So you, in principle, could have or achieve a chemical complexity um, in sulfuric acid as a solvent instead of water, but you just have to have something completely different. And this, of course, leads to formation of various different um, uh, different uh, uh, paths and, and cycles that you could have of organic molecules in the clouds of Venus. I would not go into details here on this because this is work of Dr. Jan Spacek, but I welcome any kind of questions and discussion on that as well. What's also quite important is that we, we, we also study, this is with a collaboration with uh, Jack Shostak from Harvard University and also my friend Dr. Daniel Vuzdevich from his group, that uh, we essentially are able to form also like cell-like structures in sulfuric acid as well. This is basically, uh, this is basically the formation of various membrane-like structures and lipids and liposomes um, that actually can form in this aggressive environment. What, they, what you really need is a completely different building block. So to, on Earth, you have various, fat, various phospholipids and various different um, fatty acids that form our membranes of our cells, you can achieve the same physics essentially, but you need a different building blocks. You need different Legos to build the same function in a sense. So essentially what you do, what, what we are able to actually do is to actually show that various different interesting complex structures can form in this aggressive solvent, but you just need a different building blocks to, to, to achieve that. So these are just basically just to show you that the concentrated sulfuric acid as a solvent in itself is actually an extremely interesting, uh, interesting substance that actually uh, in itself can support all kinds of interesting chemistry that we previously didn't know that could, uh, that, that could actually uh, happen there because nobody actually studied this because nobody really cared. But there is another uh, possibility for life to actually survive in the clouds of Venus. And this is something that we studied and we published recently in, uh, in PNAS in December, that this is actually the possibility that not all of the droplets in the clouds of Venus, not all of the particles in the clouds of Venus are actually concentrated sulfuric acid. And that there might be a situation when there is actually, a, so to speak, biological neutralization of acid to the acceptable level. So it actually achieves the, the more habitable conditions. And we are going to go back to this topic because it's actually connected to the anomalies question that we are going to discuss in detail. So it, there is a possibility that indeed we are actually having some fraction of the droplets or particles in the clouds of Venus that have acidities that are above zero. And as comparison, for comparison, the acidity of, of concentrated sulfuric acid is minus 11 approximately. So this is orders of magnitude much less acidic than we would first like, like we would first like we would assume but nevertheless before we actually talk about how life could in principle survive in the clouds of venus i promised you that we are going to go through and talk about these mysterious venusian anomalies 
and then connect them potentially to the to the presence or possible association uh, with life. And such uh, and there are many many of such anomalies um, in the clouds of Venus that are so that were detected and observed over the over the years as people studied this planet. And probably the one of the most um, famous one is the so-called anomalous UV absorber. So this, is, this is some sort of a substance, some sort of chemical or chemicals that absorb up to 50% of all the light that actually fall onto the planet. So this is lot, quite a lot. And this also is a phenomenon that is quite dynamic. It's spatially and temporally dynamic. It changes in quasi-seasonal fashion. And it also, um, so it's also, so it's quite mysterious. And it was first discovered in 1928. And since then, uh, for almost 100 years, nobody actually can explain what it is. People think that this might be some sort of complicated sulfur chemistry, but this actually nothing, nothing really fits. So this mystery remains to be, to be solved. There's also a mystery associated with the particles and the crowd droplets themselves. There are roughly, from the measurements by Venera and Pioneer Venus probes, we roughly know that the particles in the clouds of Venus, they fall into these three different categories, which we call modes. The mode one particles are these smallest ones, which are depicted by these gray dots here. Um, these are the sub-micron particles of approximately 0.2 micron and so on. We then have a larger uh, fraction of, of particles in the clouds of Venus, which are which are spherical and are a few microns across, a few micrometers across. These are probably these classical droplets of concentrated sulfuric acid in the environment in the in the clouds. This is basically what makes the clouds um, what they are. But there is something much more peculiar in this in these clouds as well, because on the bottom, mid to bottom uh, layers of the clouds, there is something that the pioneer Venus actually detected that doesn't really fit because it was this anomalous detection of the so-called non-spherical droplets. This, of course, doesn't make sense because a droplet cannot be a non-spherical. This actually means that there are some particles that are larger in these in this clouds that do not have, that are not spherical, that are actually have different composition and nobody actually knows what they are or what they are made of. And this, um, this is quite interesting because people, since the, since the initial detection of those particles, people still argue what they are. And people even argue if they, are, if they do exist uh, for sure or not. We actually simply have to really go back there and, and detect them again. But of course, I, wouldn't be, um, I would be amiss if I didn't also talk about the various gases that were detected in the, in the, in the atmosphere of Venus that simply do not belong there. And there is a detection of, of phosphine uh, in the clouds of Venus that I was a part, of, I am part of, and is, is just one and the newest of such anomalies in the clouds of Venus that were detected over recent decades. And this, of course, we can. I, I will not talk about the phos, about phosphine detection now in details because this would be this is a lecture in itself. But it's of course a very controversial detection, and everybody is arguing with everybody right now. But it looks like we are going to win this phosphine battle at the end. Uh, but and of course we can talk about this a little bit later after the after the after the lecture. But the point is that technically this phosphine detection is just the newest of such anomalies. We have decades-long anomalies that were lingering uh, in the literature and were not really explained. And one of them is, for example, the detection of ammonia, the very early detection of ammonia by the Russian Venera probes uh, in the clouds of Venus was dismissed as erroneous as a potential cross-contamination with the sulfuric acid or other possible errors. But recently, there were hints or tentative detections of ammonia in the reanalyzed re data from the Pioneer Venus. So the question of ammonia actually came back to the, came back to the forefront of the, of the Venusian clouds uh, again. Uh, if we talk about ammonia, we actually also have to talk about other nitrogen species um, in the clouds. The more oxidized versions of nitrogen, like for example, various nitro nitros nitrogen oxides as well, which together with ammonia actually uh, could form, in principle, hypothetically, a very nice nitrogen cycle, a biological nitrogen cycle that we actually know from our own Earth. Yes. So of course, the, in, if indeed these detections are correct, then this in itself could be a sort of a quasi biosignature in the clouds. We also have other detections that are very peculiar that were sort of ignored for decades, 
of uh, Venusian studies. This is the detection of molecular oxygen, O2, in the clouds of Venus as well, which is a remarkable detection where actually both Americans and the Russians, so the pioneer Venus and Venera probes, agree with each other and also agree on the abundance of this oxygen, which is roughly approximately 20 parts per, parts per million or so. So these are abundances that actually are too high to be explained by known processes that we know, known chemical processes in the atmosphere of Venus. So if those detections of, uh, of these old probes by the Russians and the Americans are true, then indeed we actually have some chemical process that we have no idea what it is. There are some other anomalies that are maybe less predominant, like for example, the presence of hydrogen sulfide or, uh, or abundance or, or uh, anomalies that are not necessarily associated with the identity of the gas in the atmosphere, but with its abundance profile. So here we have, for example, the sulfur, sulfur dioxide, which is in itself uh, just a regular gas that could, that could be produced by volcanoes and is indeed a very common volcanic gas. But what is quite peculiar about it is not that it is present there in the clouds, but its abundance profile. So how much of it is present? And we have a situation with sulfur dioxide that there is a lot of sulfur dioxide below the clouds, but then suddenly as the clouds actually start, there is this huge and sudden and, 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 and depletion of its abundance in the atmosphere. And this, um, this is actually something that people or various chemical and atmospheric modelers couldn't explain uh, at all. And this was actually somewhat of a problem for all the photochemical models or chemical atmospheric chemistry models because nobody actually could explain the sudden depletion of sulfur dioxide in the clouds. There are also anomalous detections of water in the, in the general uh, terms, like in the global terms, the uh, uh, Venusian clouds are unbelievably dry. Glo in, so as, are extremely dry, as I mentioned, is Atacama Desert is wet by comparison. But both Venera probes, as well as Pioneer Venus probes, had these anomalous detections when actually locally in certain pockets, there were measurements of water that were actually higher than than the global uh, average, so to speak. And we, of course, don't know if these are true or not. But if they are true, then they would suggest that indeed the clouds are much less homogeneous than we actually previously thought. And there are, of course, some other anomalies that were dismissed as artifactual, uh, like, for example, the dis 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 discovery or detection of various organic uh, gases, like methane or benzene or some other, other organic gases of this sort. Uh, they were deemed to be actually a contaminant from the spacecraft. And this is actually quite possible that they are. We just don't know if they are actually coming from the atmosphere uh, of Venus itself, or it's actually an outgassing from the spacecraft itself. So what is going on here? Actually, uh, well, if this is, this is actually what's the pro what is the problem. We've, a lot of, we've amassed a lot of data over the decades of studying of Venus, both with both with uh, in situ probes and observations, remote observations. And if and we do not really at this stage, we do not know which of those anomalous detections are actually true, which of them are errors of measurements, or what is actually going on there. Because if those detections are indeed true, then we have a menagerie of gases that shouldn't actually exist together, uh, in, a, uh, together in the atmosphere that would require some sort of chemical processes that we do not really know uh, of. So the question is, can we actually build a model that would explain these decades long Venusian anomalies and bring them to the fold, so to speak. So, the, so we have a nice and coherent, mo coherent model of the entire atmosphere of Venus uh, without actually cherry picking and ignoring certain measurements from the past. And this is of course a rhetorical question because the answer to that is yes. And uh, we've developed, or actually we, I should say that this is mostly work of, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Paul Rimmer from the University of Cambridge who is actually an expert photochemist, photochemical modeler and atmospheric chemistry modeler. And he actually developed this, uh, so far I hope, so if, I, if I, I think that I can say this, the best model of the atmosphere of Venus, uh, which actually brings these anomalies to the fold. So essentially all of those anomalies that are in these green brackets are now actually explained uh, by the model of the pole of Paul Rimmer, together with these anomalous measurements of these non-spherical particles in the lower clouds of Venus. So we actually are getting towards the explanation of all of these all of these potential uh, potential uh, interesting anomalous measurements. 
I will not talk much about the model and how it is actually developed because I do not consider myself to be an expert in this. But uh, nevertheless, if you would like to actually read about uh, how these models are being developed, uh, you are free, free to read uh, Paul's, uh, Paul Rimmer's paper uh, published in 2021. Uh, in brief, we can say that the model for the chemical models and the chemis atmospheric chemistry models that Paul developed are actually extremely complicated. They in incorporated both photochemistry, various the gassing processes, volcanism, and so on, thermochemistry, diffusion, condensation, cloud chemistry, most importantly, also cloud chemistry, all this together, hundreds of various chemical species and thousands of various chemical reactions together to actually get a picture of an atmosphere as uh, to get to get the picture of the atmosphere and see if this picture of the of the atmosphere is actually the same as we actually know from the observations. And one important point is that if we add a crucial member or chemical to this uh, model of Paul Rimmer, like ammonia, then actually this is where we actually are able to explain uh, the majority of these anomalies, which I showed on the previous slide. So addition of one of these elements into this, into this model, you actually are able to explain these anomalies. And I will just briefly show an example of, of our uh, modeling results in which we actually have a situation when we, when we have these measure, me measured values in, the, in gray points, and then we actually have different va various different models. And we actually, the, the solid line is our model, which actually fits the observations uh, much better than any previous model. And what is also quite important is our model is actually a model of the entire atmosphere from the surface to the, to the top of the atmosphere, and it does not require any artificial constraints. So the previous models of the chemistry of the atmospheres, because they couldn't really, uh, 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 really explain these anomalies, they needed sometimes a very, a very serious constraints, like for example, lack, lack, uh, lack of reactivity of certain species or, or basically fixed abundance of certain species or certain altitudes and so on. Our model does not need that, doesn't need that. It, uh, it actually naturally explains these observed values as we add this, um, as this component of ammonia. So we have this, so as you can see, we are explaining this drastic abundance drop of sulfur dioxide. So the abundance profile of sulfur dioxide is actually explained pretty well. Also the profile of of water vapor in the atmosphere is explained pretty well, especially above the clouds, which was a problem for various um, various different models. And for the first time, we are actually also able to explain the presence of oxygen in the clouds of Venus as well, as this provided uh, provide a possibility for its existence. We do not do the, do uh, as much good of a job there, but we at least do better job than anybody before us. So, what this means to summarize is that we actually could, with addition of ammonia to the clouds of Venus, we essentially could, in principle, explain many different things at once. First, we could explain these different gases that shouldn't be together, uh, uh, that are actually present together. We also explained for the first time the oxygen, the presence of oxygen, O2, in the clouds of Venus. And we also are able to explain the abundance profiles of sulfur dioxide as well as water vapor, especially above the clouds. We also explain some minor anomalies, like for example, the hydrogen um, sulfide gas below the clouds, as well as, as well as the presence of the non-spherical particles in the clouds as well. Because we have to realize that ammonia is actually a base. If you add it to acid, you form salts. So what happens is that if you produce ammonia in the droplets of the in the, in the liquid sulfuric acid droplets, then eventually you are actually going to create a solid particle, uh, ammonium salt. And this is, who knows, maybe this is b b basically what the pioneer Venus actually saw. It showed a fraction of droplets that actually are ammonium salts instead of liquid, liquid sulfuric acid droplets that are no longer spherical. So what does produce this ammonia, actually? What could be the producing mechanism for this ammonia? The problem is that you actually need to explain this. You need actually quite a bit, a large, quite significant amount of, of ammonia. So you actually have to come up with some, um, some mechanism to, to, to do this. And we, of course, don't know what it is, because all of those anomalies, they can have some sort of weird explanation. 
that uh, that is not connected to each other, but it also could be that it's indeed a result of a biological production uh, of this ammonia, because there is a condition, there is a there is a very important consequence of the production of ammonia in the clouds. And this is this, is the fact that suddenly you actually neutralize, so to speak, this acid in the clouds of Venus to much more canonically habitable levels than you previously had. So from the sort of hamet acidity levels of minus 11, which are just insanely acidic, you can go above zero to zero and one, and this actually is much more in the realm of habitability as we know it from Earth. Is this the, is this the case? Of course, this is just a mo model. We actually have to go there to Venus to dive to the clouds and actually figure out what is the acidity of the clouds indeed. So where does it bring us? It brings us to this, this the following point, is that we previously had these two insurmountable obstacles for life in the Venusian clouds, and one was the concentrated sulfuric acid. If our model is correct, then this concentrated sulfuric acid environment is to a degree an illusion, because, it, because at least a fraction of these droplets in the clouds are actually not concentrated sulfuric acid, but something else. And if this is the case, then we actually dealt with one of the challenges for life in the clouds, as we know it at least. The, it is very important to point out that the low water activity or the, the extreme dryness of the atmosphere of, the, of, of Venus still remains as a challenge for life. And it could be, and it's something that, that we, we for now do not have an explanation for. But who knows if these anomalous measurements of Venera and Pioneer that suggest the higher water content are true, and maybe there are indeed some pockets of, of higher water, um, water, uh, water abundance that we didn't know about. So uh, maybe in the interest of time, I will skip this particular slide. This is just basically a summary of what I just said. But what is quite important is that if, uh, if the new model of the, of the atmosphere, of the chemistry of the atmosphere is true, um, then this has an implications for the habitability of the clouds and for actually, actually to, to implications for what the clouds of Venus are indeed made of because it might very be, well be that, that the clouds of Venus are not entirely made of sulfuric acid, but of some ammonium salt slurries or something like that, um, which could be a result of a biological production of ammonia in the, clouds, in the cloud droplets. Now, as a result of that, implication for habitability is that there are, the clouds of Venus, therefore, are not more, no more acidic than some terrestrial environments that harbor life which is in itself quite interesting. This could also mean that what if life is a source of this ammonia neutralizing base, then essentially this could make that life essentially adapts this environment to its own needs and the, to, just to survive. And of course the challenge, as I mentioned, the challenge of extreme aridity of the Venusian clouds remains. And this is something that, that life would have to somehow deal with if it exists there, of course, quite hypothetically. But we simply have to see again how much water indeed is there is in these clouds and, uh, and go there and measure this again. So we are actually quite lucky because I am a part of, the, of an initiative that aims to actually go to Venus and, uh, and uh, study all of this. And after four decades of, um, of deliberations, we actually hope to actually figure out which of those anomalous measurements are true and which of them are were erroneous or are artifactual. So I'm, I'm part of the initiative that is called Venus Life Finder. And we actually aim to have a first private uh, mission, interplanetary mission to go to Venus to actually look for signs of life on another planet. So this, this mission is actually uh, astrobiological as its core. So we are not afraid to say this, we are actually going there to find something interesting in terms of the chemistry of the clouds, maybe even life. And we, for that, we partnered with, um, with, uh, with the company uh, Rocket Lab for our small variant of the mission, which is actually a highly focused uh, mission with a very, very special instrument that's also going to deliver unbelievably 
cool science if um, if successful. We have other com co concepts in under development, which are which are the so-called medium missions that are inspired by Vega balloon balloon missions that are essentially much more sophisticated in their scientific uh, scope. And finally, we of course know that any kind of proof of life beyond the Earth is not most likely not going to be through in situ or in remote measurements on another planet, but we actually have to have a sample atmospheric sample return mission. So we actually can subject these samples that we collect to, our, to the power of our own Earth laboratories, because only then we would be able to actually have the conclusive proof, proof of something that eventually lives on, on other planet, or maybe even some interesting chemistry, of course, that we cannot exclude. So that's going very briefly on uh, what we are actually uh, uh, what we are actually going to plan to do. Uh, the, our small mission, so which we our ro the rocket lab mission, um, is planned to be launched uh, in May 2023. So far, everything is on schedule. This is a very small mission that actually has only one uh, kilogram of uh, sort of scientific instrumentation. We will spend only three minutes in the clouds, but this is enough to measure something very, very interesting and essentially deliver science that nobody before delivered. Because what, what our main science goal uh, for this mission is actually to detect the presence of organic material within the clouds of Venus. So nobody actually before looked for organics in the clouds. This is because everybody thinks that essentially, well, probably before, because everybody thinks that sulfuric acid is actually not conducive to any kind of organic chemistry. We want to actually look for organics because obviously we cannot have any kind of life without organic chemistry. So, so establishing the presence of organics is actually the paramount here. For that, we have a wonderful instrument that is actually one of its kind developed by Dr. Darrell Baumgartner from, um, and basically this is a out of fluorescence nephelometer. So nephelometer will be able to actually measure the size and, uh, and, um, and the shapes of particles. Uh, so we will be able to automatically also confirm that there are some particles that are indeed not non-spherical. We will also get some information on their sizes and so on. So we will confirm or refute the data by, collected by Venera and Pioneer 40 years ago. Uh, but what we are also going to have is going to have some sort of information on the composition of these particles through maybe a refractive index uh, measurements as well. And most importantly, we are going to have this out of fluorescence measurement. So basically, we are going to try to figure out, detect some organic chemistry in the clouds. Of course, there are many organic compounds that are known to fluoresce on Earth. We are not necessarily looking for organic molecules that are like that, like we have here on Earth. But we definitely look for some organic chemistry um, that is uh, stable, sufficiently stable in, sul in sulfuric acid that could actually have um, the um, fluorescent capabilities. And this is basically some work from, from Stephen Benner and Jan Spacek, who, who did this work for the, in, in, in preparation for this mission, is that basically we, we are looking for specific wavelengths of fluorescence that, that we, are, we are hoping to achieve or to get if we had some organic molecules in the sulfuric acid environment. So as I said, the mission is in itself is actually pretty simple. Um, simple in a sense that is actually a probe that's been dropped through the clouds that's going to measure, um, measure all of these particle properties. We are going to spend approximately three minutes in the clouds and send the data directly, directly to Earth. And uh, let's so far, everything is on track. We are, we are, the, the Rocket Lab mission aims to be launched in May 2023. Uh, if it does, I hope that we are going to read, if, if, and if successful, we will definitely have something uh, unbelievably new when it comes to Venusian environment. We also develop missions that are much more uh, large, in, larger in their, in their scope, and also science output. Uh, these are uh, mostly, mm, mostly uh, I mean, they take they take quite a bit from the from the Russian Vega and um, and Venera probes as well, but also from Pioneer um, Pioneer experiences. Uh, so we so we actually also plan have, have some designs that have have balloon in mind and also deployment of various mini probes that contain scientific instrumentations to get actual profiles of some gases or measurements that we would like to have. And for the so-called Venus larger mission, Venus habitab VLF habitability mission. We also have the various 
um, a, basically our science objectives are focusing or orbiting around the around the habitability of the clouds. So we would like to actually solve the water question uh, in the in the clouds. Finally, see see if some of the oral measurements of water are actually true or not. We would like to determine directly the acidity of the cloud droplets because we, we really want to know if they are really concentrated sulfuric acid everywhere, or maybe they're actually some somewhat somewhat less less acidic than we thought. And we have to detect also metals and other non-volatile elements because I didn't talk about it, but Venera and Vega probes detected non-volatile elements in the clouds, like iron metal, other metals and phosphorus and so on. This is in itself extremely interesting because if true, it means that there is a some, they, they have to get to their clouds some, somehow. And if they are there, then they are really quite significant amounts of them. And we don't know if this is true or not, but if it, if it is, then it has implications for habitability as well. So the detection of various metals in the clouds is, and I mean metals in the sense of chemistry, not in the sense of astronomy, of course, but in this case, uh, this would have an important, important implications as well. So finally, we would like to also search for the evidence of life. Uh, so detect all of these anomalous reduced gases and other black and other gases like oxygen, for example, together to see which of those anomalous measurements from the 40 years before or so were actually true and which of them are wrong. Because this actually informs us about what we really should adjust in our models of the chemistry of the atmosphere of Venus and, this, and our understanding of this planet and which actually is actually um, uh, we, and which actually is actually wrong and we should, should be discarded for good. Um, finally, we also would like to further study this organic material within the clouds, within the clouds and determine the, the physical properties of the particles. So see if they are actually solid, liquid or both, or maybe determine even how, how many of those particles are there in what fractions and so on. So the homogeneity of the cloud particles in the, in the clouds is also quite important. Mm, we have many different instruments for this uh, habitability mission that are, that are potentially considered. This involves various vendors of various instruments for various different places and, 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 and countries all over the world. Uh, so we basically, we basically, when we developed the VLF initiative, we actually sort of assembled organically. And there were there was there's just groups of uh, scientists and, um, and engineers that volunteered their time to develop these concepts. And they are, these concepts are now freely available online on archive if you would like to, uh, to read them. Of course, they change as we develop them, they change. So, so some of the concepts that we presented on archive are actually maybe a little bit, are going to be changed, but nevertheless, this is the gist of the, of the idea. Um, and finally, we have our sample return mission. Uh, so this is something that we've uh, entertained as an idea because we realized that really to prove an existence of alien life somewhere on another planet, we actually need to do a lot of scientific analysis and measurements to really prove this. And that requires instrumentation that cannot be miniaturized, cannot be, and cannot be basically implemented in an easy way right now at this stage uh, on, on, an, on a spacecraft. So uh, we decided that we just basically have to bring the sample here on to Earth. Um, of course, a disclaimer accordingly to the planetary protection uh, office guidance and so on, so on. That's 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 absolutely that's absolutely um, required. But nevertheless, the technology to achieve that uh, doesn't necessarily exist. So this is a very early sketch, I would call it, and basically the development. Of this, of this idea is actually a, a something that we are going to move forward with, but it is just the development of the concept at this stage, because we have to take a very novel approaches and very novel technologies, like for example, launching a rocket from a balloon that maybe somebody tried somewhere, but it's not exactly a very, a very um, ideas that, those are not ideas that are, that are actually uh, mainstream. And we actually have to first realize, figure out if they are actually, how feasible, they are. But nevertheless, we are aiming also to develop this concept of the atmospheric sample return. This is, of course, not going to be done tomorrow, but hopefully in a couple of decades, uh, we are going to, this, this is going to be a culmination of our Venusian, uh, Venusian uh, activities. So that's basically where, where, my, uh, where, is, where we are right now. We, we would like to simply have an astrobiology focused mission and we are moving towards realization of that goal 
if we succeed, then this is going to be a to be a mission that or this is going to, these are going to be missions that are going to have a very very significant private private component in them, and we hope to actually resolve these Venusian anomalies once and for all, and that would actually in itself be extremely valuable. I this of course wouldn't be possible without many many people being involved, and I I am just a humble sp sp spokesperson for them, but uh, uh, there are many others who I would like to. Uh, thank and of course this is just just some of them um, just some of them uh, mentioned here uh, but I'm very grateful that I actually have this opportunity to actually work with them because this is really a wonderful group of people that assembled uh, completely organically and uh, and we hope to succeed and there are also many many industry industry partners that actually that actually helped us develop these concepts as well um, of course other research topics that I covered here, is the mostly uh, work of Dr. Paul Rimmer uh, and my dear friend, Dr. William Baines, and also Professor Sarah Ziegler. Without her support, uh, nothing what I actually did uh, here today, or said today wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much to them. And I'm, uh, I'm I will gladly take any questions or comments if you have any. Thank you very much, Janusz. Questions, please, here, the audience is in this room first. Any comments or questions? There's a question on Zoom from Tomek, please. Hello, thanks for this very interesting talk. And I wonder <clears throat> uh, how does it happen you know, on Earth? Uh, how high in the Earth atmosphere do we have life? That's a very nice question. Thank you very much. Because due to time limitations, I had to cut a, li a little bit of topics, of course. We do have our own uh, proud aerial biosphere on Earth, yes? Uh, we, have a, we have living microbes in the troposphere, in the clouds. Uh, we also detect and this is work of my um, colleague, Noel Bryan, for example, we also detect microbes even as high as stratosphere, actually. But there is a problem. We still, this is a very difficult field of research. And the, the finding out what is the state, is are those microbes actually alive or, or what is the state of their living, essentially, is actually quite difficult to ascertain. We know for sure that in the clouds, in the troposphere, so the lower parts of our own atmosphere, the microbes are perfectly fine and they are living and metabolizing like crazy, doing all kinds of mm, adaptations, biochemical adaptations that are actually even specific to the clouds. Like for example, there are some enzymes that are, are acting like or facilitating the cloud condensation uh, around, the, around the microbes or formation of little ice uh, crystals around the microbe. Uh, there are also some enzymes that are forming these little films around the cloud droplets to, to re regulate the, the evaporation of the droplet on our own Earth. So there is this biosphere on Earth that is inhabiting the clouds. There is a very, very important difference between our own biosphere and the hypothetical Venusian one, is that our biosphere, our, bi our aerial biosphere in the troposphere, in the clouds, is always intimately connected to this habitable surface of the planet. So, so far, we do not have an, 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 a, a proof, like an absolute proof, that there is an in situ cell division in the clouds in, on Earth. So we always need these microbes. These microbes use the clouds to live there for, for some time. Get, they get transported to a new habitat, for example, on a different continent. Yes, and they've been grained out and this is all fine. But we do not have yet an evidence for active cell division inside, in, in the clouds, in the atmosphere. This doesn't mean that this doesn't, does, that this doesn't happen because it's very difficult to, to actually detect it in situ as it happens in the clouds. Uh, we know, but this would be a difference because Venusian surface is obviously completely uninhabitable. So the, if there is something living in the clouds of Venus, it would have to figure out how to close the life cycle in the mm. clouds completely without actually in a complete disconnection with the 
non in uninhabitable surface of the, of, the, of the planet. This is not impossible, but we still don't have an absolute proof of cell division in the clouds on Earth. But we know that on Earth, they are perfectly, they, I don't remember now how many microbes are in the clouds, on our own clouds, but it is on the, uh, 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 for sure at the order of, of, of magnitude of, uh, of the microbes that we have in an open ocean. So it's actually a tons of, tons of different microbes there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, uh, following on this, is there an analogy to life in uh, layers in the ocean? I mean, there is a, some uh, microbes can live, you know, at some depth. They don't care about the bottom and they don't care about the surface. Uh, so, uh, that, then it looks like sort of an analogy to the Venusian atmosphere. But yeah. Is it right or not? Yeah, it could be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You, we have to realize that there is one feature of Venusian clouds that is better than our own clouds. Our clouds are very dynamic. They, 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 mm. they, uh, they, they, they happen to, they, they basically originate and then 30 minutes later, they, gain, they can disappear. Yes? On, the, on Venus, these clouds are permanent and the droplets can reside there for months, for weeks to months. Yes? So this is actually a, Paradoxically speaking, this is actually a very stable environment. And you could, as long as you figure out how to fight with gravity a little bit, yes, because eventually everything will, go, will fall down. As long as you figure out how to actually fight this gravitation, gravitational movement down on the total towards the surface, then you could, in principle, survive there forever. And you have to divide there as well, figure out how to divide in this cloud environment. There is one but, point uh, but that in I, a way, yeah. it's not, uh, not, not so difficult because, like, if you look at fish in streams, you know, they have to go upstream all the time, otherwise they will be flushed out to the yeah. ocean. So it's like counteracting gravity, right? There is also another point that I want to... I didn't mention that because, again, this is, there are time constraints on, the, on my lecture. But... There are vertical air movements on Venus. So there are winds that most of the winds are just horizontal. They are very, very fast. And they, in the clouds, they are very, very fast horizontal winds. But there are vert vertical air movements. If, if those vertical movements are enough to bring back material from the, bot from the, from the bottom of the clouds, let's say, before it actually goes deep to the, to the uninhabitable layers of the atmosphere, then life there could essentially use that and close the cycle without the danger of being burned to death. And then mm -hmm. it's fine. Yeah, so, so final question is, at these heights in Venus, uh, is the UV radiation from the sun penetrating there or it's completely optically thick? So it's absolutely. So this is, there is a phenomenal paper from 2021, I think, very recent one which actually looked at this, what is the radiation regime in the clouds of Venus? Because obviously if it is too much, then oops, another challenge for life. But if it is too little, then for example, maybe photosynthesis is difficult, yes? And it's actually, I would, I would just simplify this because I don't remember the exact numbers of this study, but this was a study by Patel and et al from 2021. The conditions there, are just like on Earth in terms of the light regime and UV regime and so on. So you could essentially float there in the clouds in the temperature that is room temperature and also the pressure is around one bar and have the radiation regime that is close to Earth. Okay. Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marius, you have a question? Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you, Janusz, for a very interesting presentation. And actually, I'm interested, I would like to ask you about technical question. So when you're planning for a long mission, but it is based on balloon, and probably this balloon will stay for a long time in the atmosphere of the Venus, yes? Yes. How you, it will be a lot of in, different instruments. So actually we need to some communication between F and this and this balloon. Oh no, okay. This. So how are you planning to organize this? Oh, so you see, we, as with everything there is, which we and I'm I'm going to answer your question, but I have to do a pre, 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 some some sort of a prelude to this. 
Uh, when you study these concepts, you then realize after you are done with the concept, you realize that you only now realize what you have to do. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So effectively, what we have published on, on archive is going to be changed a little bit. What we've realized that we technically do not need a balloon. Yes. Uh, because the modern instrumentation is the Russians did a phenomenal job with the Vega balloons, absolutely. But with the modern instrumentation that we actually have, we can do the we can do a probe with a parachute. And we are going to have we are going to spend enough time in the clouds to actually communicate with the orbiter and maybe the maybe even to a certain degree um, the, the Earth directly without the need of complex navigation and you know time constraints and all of that. The, this is probably something that the Russians couldn't do in the in the 70s and 80s, but um, but we would be able to do that. So now we are also looking at the concepts that do not really. We also look at the concepts with the balloon, of course, but we but we are leaning now towards the concepts which actually going to have this um, probe on the parachute, which also takes care of many of this management of the and positioning of the spacecraft uh, with respect to the actual data communication and, and all of that. But I'm, to be honest, this is a very good question to, um, for our engineers that I hope that answered correctly, they can, they can complain in the comment section of this, yes, of this video. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 I say, Janusz, I am a little bit more interesting and it's the cube satellites that it is orbiting an F. Mm -hmm. yes. So typically, with this is the orbiting the F. Yes, we keep stress more or less. We know the orbit parameters. Yes, and we know at which time it will be on some, let's say, radio telescope, and we will be able to download some some signal, some information. Yes, here it is. If it's in the case of balloon, so actually, the, if it is clouds, it is atmosphere. So of course, it is in wind, and wind probably hard to predict. Actually, yes, yes. So. Other option it is if you want to, to stay it is uh, and communicate with us. It is possible to place on the F orbit at least four satellites that we are rotating. So uh, it is, uh, you will be in, in that position, it will be independent for, the, for the, your balloon. So it is, this means that it, every time will be, some of the satellites will be able to communicate with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this. Uh, uh, one of the and I, one, I will add one comment to this. Um, the potential requirement for the predictions of the air movement in the Venusian atmosphere one, was one of the problems. Was one of the uh, potential issues with the balloon. We didn't want to, you know. There are always like the costs and benefits of things, mm -hmm. and the more unknowns you have about the environment. This is stating the obvious, and I apologize for that, but I will do this anyway. Uh, is that the more unknowns you have, the more likely is that your mission might not work. So having the, the there are still, you know, we more or less know how the winds work on the on Venus, at least these horizontal ones, but there are various various uncertainties on that. We didn't want to also really dive into this because if it would require additional modeling of wind speed and so on, and how do you know that this modeling would be correct anyway? Yes, like th that's that's another problem. So yeah. hard to believe since we, we on the F pred reliably pred predict the weather for the three four days <laughs> in the future. So, so yeah, we are we are we are bar we barely predict weather on Earth, our own magnificent planet, and now we are trying to predict the weather on on a on a different planet over the span of let's say a month. Yes, so <laughs> that's that was that's why we are actually trying to simplify these missions, even this follow up, the, even the the follow-up missions to the to the rocket lab mission because just to deal with as little unknowns as possible we are there we are going there to actually make this planet less mysterious but before we actually go there we have to deal with these unknowns you know all the time yeah okay thank you thank okay. you very much thank you very much. okay thank you very much uh i will use this opportunity to, to ask a very quick question from myself, um, because I'm very much impressed by the design and the idea to, to drop a balloon. You disappoint me that you, you're not thinking about the balloon anymore. But anyway, it's impressive. I, but I'm wondering about you know, much cheaper techniques. Uh, can you still do any of your science with new instruments being built now on Earth? I mean, you know, high resolution spectrographs, 
um, you know, for example, using stellar occultations, things like this. Is it still usable or you, you, de oh. you, de you do need to fly there? Absolutely. So this is, uh, this is uh, absolutely. So the in situ measurement, like a direct chemical analysis lab on the, so it, is, so it goes like this. First, if anything you do in the lab on Earth on a sample from, this, from, the, from Venus is the best, of course. Then it's in situ measurements, of course. They give you more, more of a handle on what's really going on. Then there are remote observations, which by all means are not useless. They are actually very, very useful. You just have to, and I will say, I will use the colloquialism here. You just really have to do it very carefully. Yes, because the point is that Mm, there are all kinds of, and I'm not, I'm not an expert in, um, in an atmospheric remote observations, Professor Jane Greaves and, and others from our team are. Uh, for example, the phosphine story, yes, the, 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 the way how, you actually, how she actually did the measurements, you have to actually do it very, very, very carefully to, to claim the detection, so to speak, yes. And I'm not going to go into details here. I mean, we've, we wrote many uh, many follow-up papers on the phosphine story to this, uh, to this, uh, to address this problem also. But what I want to say very clearly is that remote observations are absolutely useful. And since this is going, since this is recorded, I will not say more on this. But we are definitely doing them. Yes. So we are definitely uh, helping our own designs, our own our own plans, scientific plans that we have for more in situ measurements, also with uh, remote observations. What are those going to be and when and so on? You are, of course, going to know, uh, hopefully soon, in the, from, the, from our next papers that we are going to publish. Excellent. So I hope that will be another occasion to invite you again to tell us more about. Oh, with pleasure. And I'm, I'm actually based in Warsaw right now. So I hope that next time I will be able to. I, I unfortunately I got a, I got some uh, illness, so I couldn't. I mean, it was probably better for me not to come uh, directly to to your observatory. But I would love to come in person next time because um, I'm now working completely remotely, uh, and I'm I moved back to Poland permanently. So I'm basically here uh, here in Warsaw permanently. So absolutely, I would love to come and visit in person. Thank you. You're most welcome to come over here. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for this amazing lecture and the very interesting stuff. We new stuff for us. We've learned, and you were gentle. So thank you for this. <laughs> uh, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you all for joining, and see you next week. Bye bye.